racism. Mormon racism. What's the recipe? Take one large chunk, one large chunky idea that certain men today are infallible prophets who will never lead members of the Mormon church astray, add in the myth that all people lived before this life in a pre-existence, and teach that this state, we earned the color that we are here and our socioeconomic status, and blend in a false priesthood which operates under the premise that people have to be worthy to have it, season it heavily with quotes from the Book of Mormon and Pearl of Great Price which focus on skin color, and after letting it sit in the hearts of trusting people for a while, have this ripe batch of Mormon racism ready for anyone willing to swallow it. Now, remember, the first ingredient in the recipe of Mormon racism is to believe that God has called modern prophets whose words must be wholly and completely trusted. The first of these modern prophets was Joseph Smith. And Joseph Smith introduced the first concept of racism in the book he authored called The Book of Mormon. Note, most of these racist ideas are still found in the Book of Mormon today. Speaking positively, Joseph describes some people in the Book of Mormon as white and delightsome, fair and beautiful, and fair and white. In sharp contrast, he also used phrases like dark and loathsome to describe other people groups who were corrupted or chose to live evil lives. In describing the Gentiles that would someday discover America, Joseph had a Book of Mormon character named Nephi say, quote, in 1 Nephi 3.15, And I beheld the Spirit of the Lord, that it was upon the Gentiles, and they did prosper and obtain the land for their inheritance. Ready? And I beheld that they were white and exceedingly fair and beautiful, like unto my people, before they were slain. Several chapters later, Joseph describes some characters who used to be white Nephites that had now become people that he called the Lamanites. Listen to what he said. And he, meaning God, had a curse come upon them, yea, even a sore curse, because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, and they had become like unto flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they may not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. Obviously, the writer of the book of Nephi, whether it was Joseph Smith or an ancient American named Nephi, believed that dark skin was repulsive and white skin was delightsome. Reinforcing this opinion was the fact that later in the Book of Mormon, when the dark Lamanites converted to Mormonism, something miraculous occurred. Their skin pigmentation began to change back to white. In 3 Nephi 2, 14 through 15, the Book of Mormon reads, and the curse was taken from them, and their skin became white like unto the Nephites, and their young men and their daughters became exceedingly fair, and they were numbered among the Nephites and were called Nephites. But sadly, according to Joseph's Book of Mormon, as these Lamanites returned to their evil ways, their dark skin came back upon them. Later in the Book of Mormon, a prophet named Jacob, in a rebuke of his white brethren, said, quote, O oh, my brethren, I fear that unless ye shall repent of your sins, that their skins will be whiter than yours, when ye shall be brought before them before the throne of God. Now, how come God hasn't used this Book of Mormon pigmentology on all peoples around the world? Uh, the Nazi Germans, for instance, who were trying to be a superior race, a, a devout heavenly race even on earth, how come he didn't take that master race and have them become dark because of their evil deeds? What about the Bolsheviks? How come they stayed white? Or the Manson family? How come their skin didn't turn? As early America was being settled, people began to look around and wonder, who are these savage people and where on earth did they come from? Why do they look so different from us who are so civilized and how we look? There had to be a reason for these terrifying differences, and when answers were being sought by seeking people in and around 1820 to 1830, Joseph Smith was not only willing to provide them, he had the audacity to, to, to attribute these answers to God himself. Let me tell you something here and now and as plain as day. Let this truth sit in your mind. Just consider it, okay? 
God is the author of all races, all cultures, all people. Just as he created many species of dogs, Labradors, Boxers, Douch, Douch hounds, Wiener dogs, all these different dogs and cats, Siamese cats, Calicos, all these different species, he has given human beings their diversity of colors and cultures and climes. The prophet Jeremiah rhetorically asks in Jeremiah 13, 23, listen to this, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? That's from the word of God into the prophet Jeremiah, a question that is so simply put in the Bible. By 1835 and after a series of very discouraging events which caused many Mormons to begin to doubt Joseph's reliability as a revelator, the 30-year-old announced the discovery of another miraculous find, an utter lie he called the Book of Abraham. In summary, a man named Michael Chandler showed up in Kirtland, Ohio, and he had some Egyptian scrolls and mummies. And long story short, after examining him with his untrained but highly imaginative spiritual eyes, Joseph Smith claimed that they were the words of God written by Abraham himself. This new and miraculous revelation created new and miraculous faith in the hearts of those who were doubting Joseph, uh, if he would actually lead them astray, a, eh? and there was no way at the time for anyone to confirm or deny whether this translation he was providing the world was real. He just could provide it and say it's real, and people said, well, must be, you know. In this book of Abraham, Joseph claimed to decipher some very advanced revelations on matter and introduced more insights on what the Latter-day Saints called the pre-existence or pre-mortal life. In this book of Abraham, Joseph further fleshed out his teaching on a pre-existence and offered more on his ideas of progressive theology. Included in his translation of these scrolls were more insights on race except this time they were insights specifically aimed at the skin of black people and not the American Indians. The, where the Book of Mormon Lamanites got the skin they deserved from their earthly behaviors, black people, according to Smith and other trusted prophets to follow, got their skin that they deserved from their actions in the mythical pre-existence. For Mormons, the punishments blacks faced was not limited to having to walk around in a skin that was darker, but the curse also meant they could not hold the false LDS priesthood here. Uh, here. And to Mormons, the priesthood literally is everything. So while blacks could not be baptized, excuse me, so while black people could be baptized uh, and be members of the church from the onset, wasn't that generous of their Mormon leaders? You know, you can be a member with us, you just can't do anything. Uh, they were not permitted to enter into the LDS temples because only people who held the priesthood could enter into the LDS temples. And remember, if a person can't enter into an LDS temple, they can't have their family sealed to them and they cannot become a god. Therefore, by banning blacks from holding their false priesthood, Mormons were essentially banning blacks from their false heaven too. And exactly how did this black skin come out from among these deficient spirits who were supposedly coming from heaven? Through the murderer Cain. Now, that's really nice, isn't it? First, they tell the black folk that they were unfaithful spirits in a preexistence. Then they tell them they can't have the priesthood. Then they tell them that they can't be gods and they can't have their family sealed to them forever. And then they tell them that their lineage comes from Cain. I mean, and there are people who are black today, Gladys Knight, who have joined the LDS church. I don't know how they do it. I don't, I, it's unbelievable to me. Anyway, in his doctrinal commentary on the Pearl of Great Price, printed in 18, 1967 on page 400, Hiram L. Andrus wrote what I was taught since I was a child. Quote, from the information given in the Pearl of Great Price, it is apparent that Cain is the father of the Negro people, end quote. In an LDS conference of April 18, 1952, Will, Apostle Milton R. Hunter, excuse me, of the 70, Milton R. Hunter said, speaking of Cain uh, after his murder, that he was cursed of the Lord with a dark skin and he lost his holy priesthood. Therefore, everybody who came thereafter who had dark skin, black, excuse me, not just Hispanics, not Indian people from India, not American Indians, just the black race, could not have the priesthood. And if the LDS don't like those quotes, let's go to their scriptures. 
their scriptures say this is from their pearl of great price, Moses 7.22. It says, And Enoch also beheld the residue of the people which were the sons of Adam. And they were a mixture of all the seeds of Adam, save it was the seed of Cain, for the seed of Cain were black and had not place among them. Excuse me. Brigham Young, prophet, seer, and revelator of the Mormon church, who it is said he would never lead the saints astray, a said, Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If a white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God, which according to the LDS can never change, is death on the spot. This will always be so. How about a little story from the memoirs of the LDS prophet today to the rescue, Thomas S. Monson, from his memoirs, uh, from his book written in On the Lord's Aaron, Memoirs of Thomas Monson, 1985. Listen to the story he tells. You tell me about what you think Thomas S. Monson, as the leader prophet of the church, what he, he was thinking when he said this. In about 1856, we recognized that our neighborhood was deteriorating. We observed this one Halloween by the nature of the people who came in the guise of trick-or-treat. The minority elements were moving into an area where we lived, and many of the old tide families had long since moved away. Seeking counsel, I visited with Marky e. Peterson, who for many years had been the general manager of the Deseret News. O. Preston Robinson, my former professor of marketing and the University of Utah, has succeeded Brother Peterson as the general manager at, manager at the news. As I mentioned to Mark Peterson, apostle, my dilemma, wondering if it would be unfair for me to move, he simply said, your obligation to that area is concluded. Why don't you build your house in my ward? <laughs> Holy cow. I, it's unbelievable that this is just a men's club. They were probably smoking stogies when they were saying it. Oh, no, they wouldn't have done that. So what was the result of the LDS people receiving this recipe for hate over 150 years, 140 years of Mormonism? This stuff was taught. Uh, as recently as 2008 at BYU, the professor of religious studies, Terry Ball, dean of religious education, said, have you ever wondered why you were born where you were born? Why were you not born 500 years ago in some primitive aboriginal culture in some isolated corner of the world? He goes on and says, and he teaches that it was because of the agency that we expressed in the pre-mortal existence and we earned our place as a, a, an elite place among God's people, socioeconomically, skin colorly, we earn this place. To be born in the church put us on the highest level. And so it just engenders pride in the hearts of these poor people who have bought into what the prophet says. Well, Mr. Sean McCraney, LDS uh, people will cry. The ban on black men from the priesthood was lifted in uh, 1978. It's so unfair of you to bring that up today. It's 2010. Well, let me respond. First, while it is admirable Mormon leaders change their position on blacks in the priesthood, racism and the seeds of racism are alive and well in the hearts of most Latter-day Saints older than 35 or 40 years of age. I mean, we cut our teeth on this stuff. That quote was given in 2008. The idea is still there. Uh, secondly, um, the uh, LDS callers love to call in and say, you know, Sean, by our fruits, you should know us. By our fruits, they love that line. And you know, really? Are you talking about the fruits of, of racism and the fruits of polygamy and the fruits of elitism and prejudice? Uh, $40 books by your prophet? These fruits? Is this what you're talking about? Third, Mormonism has never apologized for their 140-year stance against black people being able to hold the priesthood. They only conveniently revealed this sort of quasi-revelation and then just sort of said, hey, everybody gets to have it now. Bravo, we move on now. We, living prophets, Trump dead ones, we move on. We don't care if Brigham Young said this stuff's never changing. We move on. But perhaps most importantly, what does this say about following and trusting in these living prophets who claim they will never lead you astray? Yay. Mormon racism was 140 years plus of mo modern Mormon prophets 
leading people astray, of leading them to racist actions and thoughts, of leading them to bias and hate, to justifying their elitism in the name of holy God, to pride of feeling that they were God's heavenly children from birth because of what skin color they had and where they were born. And uh, that uh, when God has given all peoples, the New Testament teaches, male and female, bond and slave, savage, wild, and disciplined and civil, any people, all people, pure freedom by the shed blood of Christ. Joseph Smith, uh, 1800 years later, reestablishes this hierarchy and starts keeping people away from God, really a crime. Now the LDS have long used God's dealings with ancient Israel to prove that even God has been exclusionary when it comes to the priesthood. The missionaries will often say to people, now God only lets certain men hold the priesthood in the Bible times. We have to try to remember that when he wouldn't let black people hold the priesthood today. Listen carefully. There's a huge difference between God saying that only a specific line of men can do priesthood duties in his temple and God saying that everyone can have these priest to do, could do these priesthood duties except a certain line of men. Do you see the difference in that? God's Old Testament way with dealing with the children of Israel was those from the line of Levi, okay? The line of Levi, they were the ones who were able to go and do those lines. And that was it. Everybody else was excluded. But the Mormons try to make a parallel to that. It, the parallel would be like this. God said, everybody on earth can go into the temple and do the priesthood stuff except those who are in the tribe of Levi. Do you see how the reverse doesn't work? Let me give you, and, and the reason that the children of Levi, uh, the sons of Levi were the priests, were because of their zeal for God, okay? So the, it's in God's eyes, they kind of qualified and earned that. So let me give you kind of a, an example, and we're going to go to the phones. Let's say that in your high school, you want to start a, we want to, we're, we're going to have a make the best school club, uh, we're going to make the best school possible club. That's the name of it, the best school possible club, all right? And in order to be a president or officer in the best school possible club, you have to have a GPA of 4.0, okay? Is that wrong? No. Anybody who has a GPA of 4.0 can lead in the, in the uh, club. Anybody. Doesn't matter who, but you got to have the GPA. Why? Because it shows that you care about school. You're going to be there more. You do more with it. And so you've earned the right to carry those. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? But... It would be one thing to let all officers in the let's make our school the best possible club be the A students, but it would be quite another thing to say that um, uh, black people cannot be those officers. And that's all it is. That's all that they said. That's what the LDS said. Anybody, they didn't even have an A thing. They said, you be a member of our church, that gives you an A. But if you're black, you cannot do it. So do you see the difficulty of that and how really bottom line ugly it was from the beginning? Now, from the beginning, when Christ died on the cross, the Lord opened it up. We keep referring to that veil being rent and it opened up and ripped in two and it was to everybody now. There was no more holy priesthood, part of the recipe of this thing. It was just for everybody. But you know, these uh, ideas and these systems of bigotry and racism, they, they came well before Joseph Smith Joseph Smith tapped into them. Mormonism propagated them above all uh, other Christian churches around. And then it's not going to end with Joseph Smith either back in 1830 and 40. In the early uh, 20th century, there were a number of ingredients floating around Europe, which contributed to a very ugly recipe for destruction. Germany had been decimated by the First World War and their economy was totally off kilter. The German people found themselves scrambling to give them hope. Times were tough, just like they were tough in Joseph Smith's young life and the Joseph Smith's family and with the people who lived in that, out in that agrarian, agrestic society back in the burned over district. Well, up stepped this frustrated artist in Germany and he had a vision and he was willing to put that vision in a book. He called it Mein Kampf, which means my suffering, okay? And he came up with a book and he in introduced his ideas of pure blood and racism in that book. And among other things, besides racism, elitism was taught. A call for restoration was taught. He presented a picture of what he called truth. There was pure bloodlines that he emphasized in that book. And in the end, he suggested to author a master race, a race of pure people, of good people, of noble people. His construction was immaculate. 
They built up cities and they did a fabulous job. He didn't believe in drinking and he didn't believe in any bad theater. He had, one, he had a wonderful utopia in his mind that came from Mein Kampf and then his power that he exuded on the German people who were looking for something to have. And from this book, his, Hitler was accepted and he gained followers and he developed a giant hierarchy of which he was at the top, the Führer. You all, and the Führer would not go wrong. You had to hail the Führer. You stood when the Führer entered the room. The result, it was Hitler to the rescue is what it was. And in the end, it, all it produced was hatred and pain and exclusion and suffering and woe and death. Um, all elements from the minds of men. None uh, of those elements are from the heart of God.